Hey guys, it's Ian Bick, and we are back with another episode of Locked In with Ian Bick. Really, really exciting interview for you guys today. I interviewed Dylan Price, who battled addiction as a child, gets assaulted in a state prison, comes out, and marries a stripper. Also, guys, a couple quick announcements for you. If you want to get 50% off my Locked In merch, check out ianbick.com and use code locked in subscriber at checkout we have shirts in white black they're printed on next level apparel really soft really comfortable great in the gym grab yours today also we are now offering exclusive memberships on my youtube channel for 4.99 a month you could get early access to interviews behind the scenes photos with guests and interact with me on a personal level Thank you guys for tuning into the show. Sit back, relax, and enjoy this interview. Dylan Price, welcome on the show today, man. Traveled to us all the way from Detroit. Hope you had a safe flight in. I mean, you're here, so you definitely got here safely. Yeah, thank Uh, you. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for coming out today. Let's get right into it. Where are you from? What's your childhood like? Where was, like, your family from? Okay, so... Uh, I grew up in Detroit um, in an addict household. And for really, dude, I understand, like, kind of <laughs> the people that were raising me. I wanted to tell you the story of my mom being deported from Canada. My mom and my dad, um, both addicts in active addiction. Um, they had some sort of argument. My mom leaves, gets picked up by this random guy in, a, in a, like, a Ford pickup truck or whatever. And she has, like, a plastic bag of clothes. And they think, okay, we're going to escape to Canada together. And they drive all the way to Canada or to, uh, to New York and try to get their way through like one of those like unmanned roads, unmanned border patrol roads. And uh, they ended up like flying into a ravine and uh, getting out of the car and huffing it. Take a liter of vodka with them and a plastic garbage bag full of clothes and following the North Star. This is like 90 three or something and how old are you at the time i'm not even born yet this is like my mom had just gotten out of prison like two weeks before this happened she spent two years in prison due to grand larceny and uh so she she's huffing her way through the with the north star uh, following the north star and uh the rick the the guy who picked her up is a threatening individual to say the least so they they fly into or they get into montreal and you know, active addiction, man. It, it it's um, I don't know how to put it, but it's running rampant. You know, they're actively using, and um, they eventually get caught for stolen credit cards, and they get deported back, like from Canada. So they sent her um, on a plane, like put her on the plane, took the handcuffs off, and um, just like sent her back. They get on the states, they get hit the tarmac. The, uh, what do you call them? Like the Border Patrol agents immediately meet her on the plane. They say, everyone, get your cards out or get your passport, your birth certificate. And uh, they start making their way out. They get to my mom, they check hers, and they scream, it's her, it's her. They tack her to the ground and have to handcuff her. She's thinking like, oh, I'm, I'm going to jail for like ever. She had a five-year tail on that. They get arrested uh, for that like deportion shit. And that's what got her deported so that's like my mother that's the person raising me all right so i was born in 94 um to that guy was that guy your dad that she ran away with uh, no so she met someone else and then had just straight up literally that was a straight up random dude who just stopped never met her before ever so yeah do you have siblings at all or is it um, just you i had a brother but he was like 18 years older than me so like my dad had another kid from another mom um like when he was 18 and he had me at 42 all right so you you guys weren't really close no 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 no, not at all so when you're born into this family what's the dynamic like are they are your parents together are they divorced are they growing up are you guys growing up rich poor oh yeah so um we definitely were poverty um my dad was not in the household when i was born um when my mom was pregnant she was clean for the nine months of my, like her pregnancy or whatever, and then nine months after, but she relapsed after nine months when my dad came back into the household. Um, and obviously, I don't remember like much before like four years old, 
but everything I, I've heard, it's a lot of violence, a lot of drugs. My mom was arrested a lot. Um, and in 99, my dad got arrested for threatening a CPS worker because he thought that it was a drug dealer or something who called my house or my mom's house. And he answered the phone and like said, I'll kill you, you f bitch, um, if you call again. But it was a CPS worker, not a dealer. So he ended up serving a year on that. Um, but when he got out, the state let me go back with him. My mom was using, I don't know where she was, um, but my, uh, my dad got me. My dad was a sick individual. He had demons, you know what I mean? He was, uh, he was hurting too. He was an addict. Um, so he got clean though. He had about two years in active recovery um, when he initially got me. Then we moved to uh, Redford, which is another suburb right, right outside of Detroit. Um, but it was it was a violent upbringing, to say the least. And how old are you when like things started to normalize a little bit, like where it was a little yeah, bit more so, stable? Maybe seven. Seven um, is when my dad got clean. Like he was going to Narcotics Anonymous meetings, twelve step meetings. Um, he was taking an active role in his life. He was working. He was still getting disability, but he was working under the table. So we had enough income to stay afloat, but like it wasn't like um, all our ends were me. Like we would sometimes not eat dinner um, that was nutritious. Like we'd just like boil a whole bunch of pasta and plain pasta. You know what I mean? Um, so you were like one of those kids growing up that always got like the school lunches. Yeah, ate dude. every meal. Never, never I utilized those. Though, dude. I took full advantage of those free lunches. I don't think a lot of people realize like what it's like to grow up like that sometimes, not having you know that meal to go home to, and you're counting on those school lunches. And yeah. I, I like I would see kids growing up that were struggling, and it would be a big deal if like there was the school was closed for a mm -hmm. holiday because the family's counting on those lunches, and that's yeah. like a very real issue in, in the yeah. country. And dude, honestly, like when I, when I was going to school, man, there, there was a large majority of the kids on free lunch, you know what I mean? Like Detroit slash Wayne County area, you know, there's a lot of poverty in there, you know, and a lot of suffering, a lot of hardship. Were you bullied at all? Um, a little bit, uh, in elementary school. Um, but I, when I was like 11 or so, my mom got clean when I was eight and she was, so both my parents are clean at eight. But not together. My dad's dating some other girl um, with a son. So I have like a stepbrother at the time, same age as me. And uh, my father or my mother was like living in a, do you know what a three-quarter house is? No. A three-quarter house is a halfway house pretty much, but for non-felons. It's for people who are coming out of like an inpatient treatment setting um, so they can reacclimate to life. Um, but yeah, it was... It was normal for a few, um, but my dad relapsed um, on a cruise he took. And when he came back, the woman he was with um, was actively using, but he didn't know. She was getting pills mailed to our address. And one day, my dad got her um, prescription bag, and he looked inside, and it was a bottle of Narcos. And opioids were my dad's drug of choice. And he had an opportunity in that moment to like either leave or kick her out. But he chose to go back. He chose to, he asked her, I'm going to take some of these. And it was off to the races, man. And he never looked back from that. He just uh, went back down that path again. Yeah, man. Uh, what was it like for you as like a child to see that? Because cool. you, you go from being born into seeing him addicted to getting clean and you're like, wow, there's a, a chance for my life to be normal. And then to see him go back into addiction, that's got to be tough. And you were predominantly living with him too. Yeah. Um, man, dude, I literally, that's so true. Cause I can't, there's so, it's so hard to describe, but I didn't know anything until, uh, I was in like uh, football, like sports, extracurricular activities. And they take me to, um, pizza hut, like after one of my practices. And they sit down with me and I felt something was weird. Like, cause my mom and dad never got together to talk with me. And, uh, my dad sits me down and he says, Dylan, I relapsed. 
and I just break fucking down, dude. Like, I'm like 12 years old in the middle of Pete's Hut sobbing because I know what that is. I know what that means. It means the life that I know it has changed. Like, and that's a lot of pressure to be on a on a 12 year old. Like you shouldn't have to know what that what that's like. Man. So how do you how do you like cope with that? How do you get through that? How do you work through that at that age? Bro, I you know, I don't think I did. I don't think I did. Um I I, I definitely did not have the coping skills necessary to fully comprehend and work through that trauma. Um, but it, what I will say though, is that my mom really tried to, to pick things up when he relapsed. She took me full time. She, we hit, we were counting pennies on the floor for laundry. You know what I mean? So like we were really struggling, but she tried really hard, man. She tried really hard. Um, but school was messed up cause I had to move schools and that's when the bullying really began. Um, it was like. I don't know, seventh grade. Yeah, it was seventh grade. And you know middle schoolers, man. Like they're they're old enough to know what hurts people's feelings, but still young enough to not fully grasp empathy. So it's just abs they're like emotional terrorists. You know what I mean? Um now I'm curious about something. Was your mom using when you were born, like during her pregnancy? Not when, not during her pregnancy. She okay. had nine months clean during the pregnancy and then nine months after, totaling 18 months. Because I'm wondering if that like carries down. Oh, yes. So scientifically, um, scientists have uh, located um, a gene in like the addicted brain that is uh, predisposed. So like if you have addict parents... Like, if you have one addict parent, you're 25% likely to become an active user. If you have two active using parents, it's like a 50% chance that you're more likely to become addicted to a substance. And when did, do you know this now, like, looking back on it, or did Ooh. you knew it at, at that age? Oh, uh, definitely. I know it now. Um, so you were basically, like, like, it's kind of fucked. You were born into, like, you were destined to become an addict in a yes. way. Like, there's a 50% chance of you becoming an addict. Yeah, I definitely was destined to be an addict. And you didn't choose that. Like, that was what... I mean, that's just something to think about in itself. Like, I don't think adults realize, like, if they're using and, and they, they're bringing a child into, this, uh, into the world, like, if they're on alcohol or if they're using drugs or anything, it could fuck their yes. child up and, and have, like, an adverse effect on, on it. Dude. And literally. their people are just not talking about that. Yeah, I so I grew up in the... Um, like, when my parents are clean i grew up in 12 step programs so like i went to meetings with them and stuff and you could see that you could literally see the the trauma the lack of coping skills and the children who came to the meetings they're um, just actively bringing their kids to yeah 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 yes yeah. uh well one i to be honest man like there's a lot of um there's a lot of positive qualities with coming to a 12 step meeting there's a lot of community around it um but that's just like so different it's to so like grow different. up. I mean, instead of having like a family pizza night or a game night, you guys are going, going to, like, to a 12 step meeting. Yeah, that's just, <laughs> that's absurd to me. Like, I just, I can't imagine that. That's funny that you say that because I, I honestly, I never thought about it like that, but that is right. That is. Well, that was your normal. We probably should have had a pizza night. <laughs> <laughs> so when do things start taking a turn for the worse for you? Is it like high school where you start going down a bad path or you hang out with a bad um, group? Where do, where do things turn for you? Well, what I'll say is, so in the when I was mid in middle school and I was getting bullied and stuff, it was tearing down my self-esteem. So by the time I did enter high school, um, I was desperate for, for friendship. You know what I mean? Like you're in high school, you're trying to find yourself, trying to find out who you, who you are um, and who you are going to be. Um, and I and I had no idea what I was going to be. I had no idea who my friends group, who my friend groups were. Um, I, I really, man, I, I'll be honest. Like I was a loner in high school. Um, my freshman year, um, I, I had literally zero friends. Um, but my mom eventually moved with her boyfriend at the time um, to a, a nice suburb, like a nice suburb. It's called Plymouth. It's in. Um, Wayne County still, but they, it was like 6,000 people high school, a lot of extracurricular activities. They put me in baseball. I was varsity my sophomore year, so I was pretty good at baseball. Um, and that was my friend group. Uh, 
And then junior year, I tore my rotator cuff, and that took me out of baseball. So I had nothing to do, no friends, no nothing. And that was like the one thing that made you normal. Exactly. The baseball, the friends, it gave you some sense of normalcy in your life. Absolutely, it did. It, that was the the main thing that kept me connected to the community and so outside how did that, of addiction. How did that injury affect you mentally at that point? Does that like change things for the rest of your life? Yeah. Yeah, it did. I, I had hopes that I was going to get a scholarship for baseball, break this cycle because my parents hadn't gone to college. My mom went back to college once she got clean. Um, but for me, like that was the plan. I'm going to, you know, get a baseball scholarship. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to get out of this. So when the actual injury happened, I didn't even, it it took a while for it to register that I wasn't going to play again. Um, you know, I went to physical therapy and, you know, they were telling me that it was unlikely that I was going to be able to compete at a high level. So I took that as like, Instead of like trying to work through it, continuing physical therapy, I was like, fuck it. Let's, let's find something else to do. And that's where I encountered like the drug group. I had a, friend, a group of friends. Um, it started with marijuana, as everyone does, you know what I mean? Not that I'm saying like marijuana is a gateway drug, because there are a ton of positive qualities to marijuana. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for an addicted person, but there are a lot of positive qualities, healing-wise. Um, but it started off with that and drinking. Um, I didn't get in my first like legal trouble until I was like 17. We were all smoking in a parking lot, like 4 a.m., like loud as hell, just being reckless teenagers. And next thing we know, four police cars pull up around us. My, the buddy in the front seat who had the marijuana on him, like shoved it in his pants in between his nuts. Um, and, uh, <laughs> uh, we, the cops, cause we were 17 at the time, they couldn't arrest us. So they got my mom and, uh, <laughs> my mom was tearing us a new one, telling us how irresponsible we were and shit like that. But that's, that was par for the course at the time. And then it progresses worse from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Way worse. So at, at its like worst peak, what kind of drugs are you doing? Um, at the worst of the worst, crack, heroin, meth. And how old are you? Um, well, I started heroin at 19. That was that the first like hardcore drug aside from marijuana that you um, did? I would say so. I started, I had Xanax before, um, like the anti-anxiety medication. I had a real problem with that. So how are you exposed to heroin or the, or any type of drug on that level aside from marijuana? Like what's that first experience like? Like what's that, de- the decision in your mind being made saying, I'm going to try this. How do you commit to doing that? Man, uh, well, it was a conscious choice for me. So um, I had a, a friend who was, you know, a, a pill head at the time, um, taking uh, Xanax, Vicodin, whatever. Um, and I get in his car one day, and I just, I straight up tell him, I want to do heroin today. And the drug addict that he was, was like, all right. And we live in Detroit, you know what I mean? So, like, Detroit's a relatively easy access for heroin um but like why like what 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 looking back on it now yeah why why would you just say man like man i want to do heroin today insanity i don't wake up thinking that or i I, even when i was a kid like that was never in my mind so coming from you what what's that like like what do you think it was um i don't know the allure that it had it took my parents away from me you know what i mean like the fact that you can love your child so much, but this drug is so much more important, that allure, that like that curiosity of why is, is it so good that they would, ch- it, they would choose this over their entire family and everything they love? And that was the pull for me. It's like may, maybe this thing, maybe this drug will give me the feeling that I always wanted but never had. So do you think had your parents not been addicted to that drug, you would never have even thought in your mind to try it? Yeah, 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 definitely not. Definitely not. Um, It just, like you said at the beginning, like this was a predestined. Does that make you think like going forward, like when you have kids one day and what you want to do with your life, does that make you more conscious? Oh. As like a parent thinking boy, about boy. what you're going to do with your kids? Yeah, I, I, I am a father today. I have a two-year-old. Okay. Um. 
And yeah, man, I am super, super on top of that, man. Like I, I, I understand that because her mom, um, my wife is also a recovering addict. Um, I, I'll tell you more about that, but my daughter, like I, I'm so, um, hyper conscious of like what environment she's in, what she's going to see. Cause kids don't always do as you say, they do as you do. You know what I mean? So I want her to see me working my ass off, staying away from drugs. Like I don't want to really take her to 12 step meetings either. Cause that's kind of exposing her to that, that idea that drugs are something, you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're 19 years old, you try heroin, you're doing other drugs. How are you supporting this drug habit? Do you have a job or are you committing so, like crime to support it? <laughs> yeah. So at 19, I was selling heroin too. Um, we were living in this busted ass trailer, me and the guy who initially got the heroin together. Um, and we were selling, just trying to use like what we wanted, but use it for free. So we'll sell, I don't know, 20 bag to two 20 bags and get a free 20 bag for us. So you're doing it just to support the exactly. habit. You weren't looking to make money. And, I mean, I was looking to make money, but I was doing too much heroin to make money. Yeah. Um, I basically every drug dealer I've talked to when they're de using, they don't really make much money because yeah, they're no. smoking their supply. Yeah, literally. That was exactly the case. Um, now, are you injecting heroin or are you smoking it? Well, at this time, I was not injecting. Um, I was snorting it, uh, but it only took like two months before I injected it. And what's worse, to inject? To Definitely to inject. That's the worst because it goes right into the bloodstream? Yeah, yeah, so the like the effect itself is way stronger when injected um, and also way more addictive. Um, however, I will say that at the if you're like in the process of, of shooting up, it, the risk is huge, huge risks. Um, myocarditis, which is like a... a bacteria in the heart um like hiv age i have hep c i got hep c from injection um yeah not fun and you still have it now like yeah yeah, yeah. i'm being treated for it um so like so do you have to like disclose that to people like is that like considered like a like what and is it's that not like a, uh hiv where um like it's transferable like that it's only transferable through like blood to blood contact so if i was bleeding into your open wound, you have a low likelihood of getting it, but it is a possibility. Now, at this point in time, do you have any relationship with your parents, like while you're using at your peak? Um, no, so my mom wanted nothing to do with me because I kept stealing from her. I stole everything in her house. And she's clean. Yeah, I'm, she's huh. clean at this time. She's going on like 11 years clean because she got clean initially when I was eight. Okay. I'm 19 now. Um, she wants nothing to do with me. I, I still, I've, every time she would go to sleep with me in the house, I'd steal all her TVs. She has woken up multiple times to no TVs in her house. And you're just taking it to the pawn shop. I'm not even taking it to the pawn shop. I was too lazy to do that. I would take it to the drug dealer and just say, please take this TV. And she's not trying to help you at all? Like trying to get you clean, like oh, bring you to a rehab and Desperately, anything? she's trying to do that, bro. She's dead, but I'm not listening to shit. You know what I mean? I'm just poo-pooing her I mean, you know do you i'm i'm i'll survive i'll make it um and that wasn't working <laughs> yeah. that wasn't working I and what was, about your dad um so my dad said could, if you remember he relapsed when i was like 12 so he was still using and i didn't see him for like six years so he's using for almost a decade more after that because you're almost you're in your early 20s at this point yeah yeah um Man, I actually, my, uh, so I, like I said, I didn't see my dad for six years. So when I did see him again, he was the shell of a human that I remember. He was 90 pounds, soaking wet. Um, from what I understand, he had lung cancer, but didn't do anything about it. Um, and I stayed with him for a while in, in the middle of my addiction. And you're both using together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's not injecting, but he's snorting. How is he supporting his habit? Like He's his... getting uh, disability. Okay. He's getting disability, and his partner um, was also getting disability. So they were using together. We were all kind of supporting each other's habit. What when a I relationship didn't... right there. <laughs> it was really messed up, man. I, I look back at it now and realize and see how kind of sick it was. Um, but... At the time, like I was so wrapped up in like what 
what's going to get me my next one? And that was the mentality I had. You know, that's the mentality my, my dad and his partner had. Let's just get high. Now, what actually lands you in jail? Um, is it just petty crimes or do you do something serious that lands you into that? Or is it like a buildup? And so it's kind of like a buildup. It's, it's crime after crime. So in my first charge was a retail fraud trying to steal from Kohl's. Trying to, I shoved uh, like a $60 bottle of like cologne in my pants and tried to walk Every out. kid did that. And like, I, I remember when, um, before they used to lock up the colognes at like CVS and Walgreens, you, uh, the middle school kids would go, they would steal it and then sell it. It was like the Ralph Lauren, the knockoff. Yeah, yeah Or the, um, there was some other popular one, Verve or something like that, yeah. that we would get. And that was the popular thing. Now they lock up all that. I was at, yesterday I was at, <laughs> Walmart getting like Polaroid uh, yeah. cameras. They even lock those up now. They lo they're locking up everything. The whole electronics department's it's locked up. It's probably my fault, man, because I've <laughs> stolen. Dude, literally, you name a store, I have taken that place for a ride, bro. So you steal from Kohl's, you get arrested for that? Yeah, yeah. So that was my, I was like 18 when I first got arrested for the retail fraud. But that was probably like a slap on the wrist. Nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, like I non-reporting probation. Like I did, like that got, got out from with like a $500 bond. Went to court, never saw a judge, probation officer again. And then you just kept doing things like that? Yeah, yeah. So that was a learning experience. Instead of like, man, I got to not steal shit. It's, oh, okay, I got to be better at stealing. So I, uh, <laughs> I, I tried to like creatively um, steal shit from other stores because I was banned permanently from Kohl's. Like they had my picture next to their So could you go into register. a Kohl's today or no? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think they <laughs> want me out. I don't think they want me there. And that's okay. You know what I mean? Yeah, who shops at Kohl's? Right, I, I get it. I think I they're it. going bankrupt. Yeah. So. Um, but yeah, that was my first charge. Um, but they it, it, it progressed quickly. So after the year of non-reporting probation, that was when I was selling the heroin. And... Uh, I was supporting my habit from with retail fraud too. Walmart, um, like J.C. Penney, Publix sometimes. Um, but yeah, I I was stealing to support my habit. Uh, my honestly, my drug dealer uh, at the time was this old ass um, African American woman who had like kids and grandkids in her house. So she instead of like me paying her. She would let me steal like Spider Man and Superman toys from Walmart in exchange it for drugs. Wow! So I was stealing like literal action figures in exchange. That was that was my play for a while. So this eventually all catches up to you, and you get jail time for all of these different crimes you're committing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, I get <laughs> this is <laughs> I get caught in another cold. That's how um, one of them. So I was sick one day, withdrawing from opioids and. Um, I don't know if you know anything about withdrawing from opioids, man, but it is a nightmare. Like you feel like you're dying. And I, uh, I call my buddy and I, cause I'm not driving at the time. They already suspended my license at this time for not showing up to court. So I ask him, Hey, I need a ride. Uh, I'll go take me anywhere. I just need to steal something. So of course I choose Coles again, despite me being banned. Um, and I just go in there with a the backpack and start shoving Nike shirts and shoes in my backpack. Not even giving a shit. They're watching me. They're straight looking at me. I'm making eye contact with fucking employees as I'm shoving Air Force Ones into my backpack. It was not good. Um, so I try to walk out and the loss prevention guy's right behind me. He's like, don't fucking do it, dude. I'm already on the phone with the cops. So like we look at each other, me and the, the driver are like, oh, fuck, we're, we're, we're screwed. So we f jump in the car. And I'm like, because I put some clothes on under my normal clothes. So I have like four pairs of shorts on, two pairs of boxers, and I'm trying to rip them off as he's speeding down the street. And we see cops coming the other way with their lights on trying to stop us. And they ended up, he's trying to escape. He's trying to literally high speed chase these cops. And, and I'm telling him from the back seat, like, bro, they're going to get us. Stop the car. They're going to get us. And so he stops the car. They actually they didn't stop. The, he didn't stop it on purpose. They cut him off. They rode him off the road into the grass. Oh, wow. And they, they come up, guns drawn. Um, I'm in my boxers. Like, literally, like, I have one pair of boxers on. I'm on the phone, like, trying to call my mom, tell her, like, Mom, I'm about to be arrested. Like, just letting you know. And uh, 
he, he pulls me out. He doesn't even let me get shorts or pants on. He let, he makes me sit in the boxers. Um, and they knew you were wanted at that point. Too. Yeah, and I had a whole bunch of warrants um, for retail fraud, drug possession. And then at the time that I actually got arrested, I had uh, heroin needles and a crack pipe on me. So they arrested me for that. Um, I served like 43 days in county jail uh, for that. And when I get out, I'm supposed to be on probation. I do not do probation well. Like I, I've never completed a probation in my life. It always ends up in jail time. Usually because they hit me with like a lot of the like 12 meetings a week or, you know, go to one-on-one -on -one therapy, community service. And I just was too lazy to do that because I was caught up in my addiction, just getting the next one. Uh, so I'm like 22, 22 or 23. Um, I'm, I'm using heroin on a regular basis every single day, um, maybe $50, $60 a day, which is a pretty bad habit. Um, <laughs> and a dealer at the time near my house lived in an apartment um, on the second floor, and I had a buddy uh, who would go with me to pick up drugs with him. And this time he wasn't home. So our thought is the drugs are in this house. All we got to do is get in. So we try crowbarring his door. And we're in like, do you know apartment lobbies? Like, so like you walk into an apartment building and there's like separate apartments, but they're all in the same like hallway together. Yeah. So we're in the middle of a hallway with six other apartments right by us trying to crowbar this guy's stuff. Doesn't work. So we go downstairs and uh, we go around to the back where the patio is. And I boost this guy up into his house. Um, he unlocks the door and we ransack this dude's house. Take like $1,000 worth of drugs um, and money. iPhone, I think. Uh, and they end up calling the cops. So like... They knew where I lived, and I don't know how the guy knew it was me who robbed him, but I get a call from my mom saying that your drug dealer's here, and he's threatening to shoot me and the, like shoot up the house. So I'm like, oh, fuck, dude. So I call the police. I'm like, hey, there's this drug dealer at my mom's house. What do I do? Like, Can you please go there? He's armed. Um, so they go. They kick him out, but they can't arrest him because there's no proof but he that's when he tells the police that i broke into his house so when i come home they're waiting for me like i'm i'm thinking i'm gravy dude i think the cops kicked this guy out like I, i'm i got all the drugs were squared away i get back and there's two cops waiting for me inside of my house and that's when i got popped for the home invasion that's what sent me to prison and how much time do you get for the home invasion so i got 13 months total so, and are you clean by this point like when when you go into prison hell no so, i am sick as a dog i am sick as shit dude like literally i'm throwing up shit in my pants um that was like the first yeah. few weeks of prison yeah so uh i got so in michigan they have a, a protocol where they send you to jackson which is a, a prison that like it's a max security but it's also quarantine <laughs> So I got there, and that's where, like, the, the throwing up, the pissing and shitting out of my butt would be. Like, it was bad, dude. What year was this, and how old were you? 2016. I was, like, 22 or 23, maybe. And this is your first time ever really, like, doing a long yeah, sentence. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is my first time um, riding the lightning. <laughs> yeah, yeah what, what are you thinking? Like when you're, what, when you get a little bit sobered up and, and your the withdrawal pains are subsiding, what, what are your thoughts about this prison and where you're at? Mm. Um, man, I, uh, I was shocked at first, you know what I mean? I was, I was anxious. Um, cause I'm a small guy. I'm five, six. So, but I mean, I can scrap. Like I can fight. I was when I was bullied. I I always used to fight back. Um, and this is just a regular state prison. It's nothing special, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing crazy. No. What what type of people are there? Um, a lot of drug addicts. For the most part, it was a lot of addicts. Um, there was so like in the prison itself, like in quarantine, 
I was pretty much locked away from everyone. You know what I mean? Like there wasn't a lot of um, violence because um, people are just trying to get to their own spot. But when I went to like the actual prison they sent me to, there was like gangs. So that was my man. <sighs> Shit. That was uh, that was when I got checked. So I I didn't want to join a gang, dude. Like I I just wanted to do my time and get out. This is a, the first week you got there to this prison. This is the first They're week they're approaching I... you to join a gang. Yes. So how does that go down? So uh, I'm like literally like in the day room, and they it's I don't know what they call themselves, the Aryan Nation, the Aryan Brotherhood, the White Power, one of those. And they said, hey, man, you got to you gotta rock with one of us to be safe. You got to put in work. And I'm thinking, like, fuck, no, I don't. What do you mean, bro? Like, I'm just chilling. You know what I mean? Like, let's do our time and let's get out. That's the goal here. Like, can't we all just get along? And that that didn't work out. So, like, I, I, I told him no, but super respectfully. I was like, listen, man, I'm just trying to get my time done. I'm not really trying to put in work for anyone. I'm not. I'm not like that. I'm not about that life, quote unquote. And it's he seemed kind of cool about it. I thought like, all right, that's cool. Um, and then I, I was alone for a while. You know, I mean, it was about a week, week and a half. And uh, I'm I'm showering. Um. And uh, while I was showering, two people, um, one of them was the shot caller for the African-American people there. They were, they were bloods. I don't, I don't know what gang they were affiliated with, but I'm, a, I'm pretty sure it was the bloods. Um, it was two of them. Oh, shit, man. And so, like, when I was showering normally, and I heard them at first. I heard them come in. Um, and I and I asked, what's up? I'm butt-ass naked, bro. And I asked, like, what's going on? Are they naked or are they just there? No, the they're, they're, in their, they're in their whites and grays. Um, and one of them turned off the shower, dude. And I was, like, I was mad confused. I thought I was about to... Um, like scrap or something, or I thought they came in there to like smoke a cigarette or some shit. Um, and one of them just hits me, like, like I wasn't expecting it. I was like, "Hey, man, like, what's up?" And it was just a fucking haymaker, and he hits me. And like, now, I, what do you do in that moment? I, man, fuck, dude. Like, I, I'll be honest, dude. I froze. I froze, bro. You know, I I, uh, I fall to the ground, um, and one of them kicked me in the head, and I start covering my head up, and I felt one get on top of me, and uh, they raped me. Holy shit. Yeah, bro. I mean, that really changed my life. What are you like thinking like in that moment? What what happens? Does anyone does anyone come in? Bro. Do I'm screaming, bro. Like I'm screaming. The, the, everyone in the pod can hear me, dog. Everyone in the pod can hear me. I'm screaming, help. No one came in. They all let her have. Where are the, like, the officers? This, I don't know, bro. Literally, there's no officers. There's no COs in there. Like, the only time I saw a CO was when they brought fucking commissary or something. We, it was like a 60-man a, a pod, and they, they, they just had cameras, and when they needed to talk to someone or pull someone out, they would all they would do is make an announcement and then pop the doors. Like, do you know what these guys are in prison for? <laughs> um, one of them was for assault, um, and I don't know what the other one was in for. So what's your next move after this happens? Like, what do you do next? Do you go to the hospital? Do you go to the CO? So I went to a CO, 
And you reported what happened? Yeah. Yep. I reported what happened and they put me in solitary confinement. So they put you in the shoe. They put you in protective custody, basically. Yep. Did they send like medical to come check you out? Or what does anything happen? Nope. Nothing. No. Nope. Did you ask for, for them to check you out? No. No, I didn't want anyone touching me. I didn't want it. Dude, I I was I was so fucked up, bro. Like I just remember having this horrible anxiety. Like it was gonna happen again at any moment. Um And they didn't even provide any type of like psychologist to not come see a you shit they literally provided nothing that's crazy they put me in the shoe they like i was punished for what happened to me well that's how these prisons work like if you need protection or anything there's like they'll say protective custody all it is is them putting you in the shoe you're not in like some special literally. unit or anything like that it's just it's crazy what they do so you spend how many how long are you put in the in protective custody for uh, two weeks or so. And do they move you to a different prison? Uh, no, they move me to a different unit pod. Okay. Yeah. And are people talking ab in the prison what happened? Oh, yeah. Like words getting out. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and how long are you into your stay at this point? Like how much time do you have left? Six months. You have six months left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So how do you even navigate? Like wh what are you doing? Like I couldn't even imagine that having that mindset of what happened because that's traumatic like no one deserves that to happen to you and you still have six months left to do what's your outlook at that point violence i'm one i wanted revenge which i never got and i wanted to not have that happen again so i did um put in quote unquote work for the Aryan brother. Dude, I honestly, I don't even know what they're fucking white dudes. So you went to them and you said, hey, I want to ride yeah, with you yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they knew what happened. They knew what happened. Honestly, in my personal, like, I... And you I, think they set you up? Yeah, I do. And dude, that's so crazy you say that because I, I, I honestly, like, I never thought that someone could have that because i didn't do anything wrong with these people you know what i mean they just wanted you to be a part of them and yeah. to do yeah. to do bro i'm telling you man i've thought about it a lot and i truly do believe that's what happened so they let you in to ride with them now yeah so what are you doing for them what do you have to do for this protection um well a lot of it was i held knives so like in my particular bunk um i could like there was this open metal grate underneath the second bunk and you could hide like three knives in there at once no problem can't even tell so that's mostly what i did um and i had a fight i guess there was another kid he was uh african-american real young um, I honestly, in my, per now this is uh, just a guess, but I think he was a chomo. Um, so like when they came, when he came into the pod, the quote unquote shot caller told me, um, that I was going to fade with him. And, uh, we did, I, we, we just went in there and honestly, the kid was smaller than me, but I got my ass kicked. <laughs> but you put you you fought and yeah. you you showed up. Yeah, I showed up. I w I was ready to rock because in my head I thought if I don't do this, they're gonna do something to me. So this prison turned you into more of a violent person. You, oh, dude! You went in as a drug addict, not a hardened criminal. You're in for shoplifting, yep. and it turned you into something you never wanted to become. Yep. Well, I'm actually I was in there for home invasion. Home. Yeah, but it wasn't like a violent. Right. Exactly. You say home invasion, you're thinking like armed guns and stuff. You guys are a bunch of addicts that <laughs> I, I, you know jumping through windows. Yeah. Exactly. I think it's insane that they you have a one year sentence and they're putting you in with these types of people. Bro, literally, that's exactly what I was. That's thinking a real too. problem in the system. I mean, like, why are like fraud guys, why are drug addicts being put into facilities with dangerous individuals and there's no security, like? The, the 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 co aspect the co Dude, aspect the crazy. ratio it's terrible that was honestly the one of the craziest parts like you could have gotten killed like you literally. literally and you all you had was a drug addiction yeah i think back to it now and, and 
definitely recognized like, holy shit, man, I was, I was sick, you know what I mean, going in there. But what that prison turns me into, like what happened while I was there, was by far um, worse than what I experienced in active addiction up until that point. So with this just being like a like a state prison, like a regular level state prison, there's still a lot of politics in this, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, what what are the politics like? Are they checking paperwork? Are the sex offenders and the snitches not allowed at certain tables? Like, uh, definitely the sex. So the sex offenders that they tried to put sex offenders in our pod, like a few times, and that always worked out really poor. Like they. It, it, it was a paperwork. So everyone gets their paperwork checked if they look suspicious. You know what I mean? Like typically like um, like the homies from the street or something who like come in don't really get their paperwork checked because everyone kind of understands. Um, but like the, the, the child molesters and stuff, they got, they got, some, they got some shit that come in their way. And I mean, they, uh, they had a rough go of it to say the least. Um. Mm-hmm. There was uh there were shot callers who on a whole um were pretty chill people, but what they asked of you um of their people was not indicative of um <laughs> a good leader, you know what I mean? Like there was a lot of violence. It was really I think it was all an attempt, um to kind of, I don't even know how to describe it, man. But like fit in. You so know do you I think mean? these people are actually tough? Or no, dude. They were just going along with it? They were just going along with it. They were just exposed to this like ecosystem, political system, and they turned into this. Absolutely. That's, that's kind of exactly like what you right. had to do as well. Yeah, that was... um Because it's sink or swim. Like you learn to adapt really. That's the one thing prison can teach you. It's You, you, have, you have no choice but to adapt. Yeah. That's that's one hundred percent. Because not adapting it ends up with what happened to me. You know what I mean? I because you think going in that like okay, I can do this. But I only got thirteen months. I can do this without violence. I can do this without linking up with the gang. Because that's how what you're you're grow up meant to think the system's like. You're 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 growing up meant to think that all cops are good. And that the law is always right and that the court system's fair and that you can go to a system and you're going to be safe. You're in prison. You're exactly. doing your time. You're supposed to be safe, protected. That's all the movies, dude. I yeah. don't need to worry about that. I don't need to worry about someone coming in the shower after me. I don't have to worry about um, gangs and violence. But I'm, I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong. You know, I mean, prison is, um, they call it like the prison I was in, they called it gladiator school. Because of the the violence that was there, you had to fight. Um, and you're just seeing violence normally. On yeah, a, on a I actually do. I saw. I was in um, a lunch the lunch line one time, uh, and I this uh, Mexican gentleman literally like walked up behind someone two feet in front of me and sliced his face wide open, like you could, bro, like you could see his teeth. Wow. Through his mouth. It was horrific. Blood everywhere. Now, I, my, that was the first time I saw anyone slashed or something. So, like, I'm fucking, holy shit, what's going on? Help this guy. Dude, everyone around me is not doing anything. They're just sitting there. You know what I mean? So prison's a weird spot, man. You know what I mean? It turns you into something that you didn't think you were capable of being. Now you get out. How long did you actually serve on that 13-month sentence? Um... 374 days. So uh, j- about a year, basically. You get Ten out. Days over a year. What do you do when you get out? Are you back into drug addiction or are you trying to get your life together? And a little you- bit of both. So like I under- at this point, I definitely understood how um, damaged I was, how important it was to um, get some sort of sobriety under my belt. Did you see like mental health treatment at all? Not at that time. No, no, no. <laughs> Um, in fact, I, I thought to myself that I'm not the problem. It's the state I'm living in. It's because Michigan has access to drugs It's because, um, I, I thought it was everyone else, not me. So what I did is I 
told my mom I'm moving to Florida and she wanted to come with me. So she sells her house to move down to Florida with me, pack everything on top of a Honda Pilot. Because she's trying to save her kid. She's trying to save her son. And uh, she fly, she goes, we drive down to Florida. And uh, from day one in Florida, I was seeking out drugs. Like I would go up to homeless men on the street. Hey, man, where's the heroin at? Um, and that never worked. But what did work is I went to a strip club. And I go to the strip club and I ask one of the dancers to get me heroin. And this dancer pulled out a bag of fentanyl. And in my head, I'm like, I'm in love. And now this woman. With the stripper or the drugs? <laughs> a little bit of both. So like it was, it was her. So um, or just her like willingness to whip that bag out and, and, and give me fentanyl right there and then. And what, she told you it was fentanyl. Yep. Absolutely she did. And uh we do it together, and I find out that this girl's like homeless. She's living in a homeless shelter with bed bugs and shit. So I'm like, come on home with me. And you bring this stripper. I bring the that stripper home to the. And me and my mom got like a a mobile home trailer. When she sold her house, she didn't like buy a house in Florida. She just got like a mobile home trailer, saved some money, put some in the bank. Um, so we get there, and man, like my mom is livid at first. But to be honest, man. The three of you guys are living in this mobile home trailer. My dude, fuck. My addiction was sick, bro. Um, now this woman that you brought home, she becomes your wife. Yeah, that's yep. a crazy story. Yeah, dude, it, it gets even crazier too. Cause I honestly, dude, like I, I'm ashamed to say this, but I got my mom to relapse. You got your mom to relapse because you brought her home. No, I brought drugs home with theirs. So like. Imagine if you sit in a barber shop, eventually you're going to get a haircut. You know what I mean? But your mom had been clean for like 15 years yes, at this point. Literally. Seven, so she had been clean 17 years at this point. And uh, she like hurt her foot or something. And I kept suggesting, get some Vicodin, get, get a couple Norcos, get some opioids in you. And that just set her and off. And that just set her off, dude. Wow. And so I was having to, like my girlfriend who later became my wife was still stripping um and on the side she was hooking up with like guys for extra money um and you were okay with this oh man it's hard to describe so like not really i was not really okay with it so but i was okay with it because i got drugs no it's full-on like prostitution yes basically. correct full-on prostitution so she's getting paid for this and what's like the conversation like at home uh well i i definitely try to like, do you think about it or? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I definitely think about it. It, it hurts me. It's so, like when she would come home with money, I, I like, I couldn't help but obsess over like, oh, man, like. Who was the guy? Who was the guy? How'd you get the money? And honestly, like, as sick as I am, I thought, is he better than me? Did you enjoy it? And like, he, even for a job, like, I, I, dude, I'm telling you, man, like, I was so insecure about it. You know what I mean? Because I, in her eyes. It was just for drugs, but in my eyes, it was like some sort of infidelity. You know what I mean? But really, it was an exchange of goods and services. Yeah. So you were looking at as this is what you guys needed to do to provide, so you guys could keep up your habit and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's crazy. I've never actually talked to someone that like you, we have a lot of friends that have like a girlfriend on OnlyFans or something, but that's like different because that's like virtual. Right. So to talk to someone that actually had like that the physical act aspect of it because it's it's a, it's a job. Right. People do do work that. It's the oldest profession in the world. But it's got to be tough for the man. But I guess you're also you're addicted to drugs, so it's a different outlook. Like my outlook's going to be very different as someone that's sober than someone that's addicted to drugs trying to Dude. do whatever to get by because it's a lot of money they're making literally and at this time like all three of us are strung out addicted and we realize like okay like the only way this is gonna change is if we get treatment um so we didn't understand how to get treatment in florida so without any place to live without like any plans we drive all the way back to michigan because that's where we know there's treatment available. Um, so I tell her and my mom, like, let's just go back. We'll, we'll find treatment. We'll get into treatment separately. 
or I'll go one at a time. Uh, and that didn't work out, man. Like, so we, we go back and we're sleeping in the pilot. We're sleeping in the Honda pilot SUV, like all three of us cramped. We have a dog in the car and a cat in the car. Sleep. So this is rock bottom. Jail wasn't rock bottom. This right. was rock Dude, bottom. Dude, and it gets worse too, bro. Literally. So like, we're living in the car for a while, stealing. Like, we'll drive to uh, like different Walmarts throughout the state of Michigan, steal as much as possible, and then either trade it to the drug dealer themselves for the product or find someone to buy it. Uh, and that went on for like four months and my mom's like elderly, she has MS, but she's still using. I continue to get my mom high. And it's it's chaos. It's we're always arguing. There's always a problem going on because that's just addiction. You know what I mean? Um then uh my mom decides one morning when she wakes up, I'm going to I'm going to treatment. So she goes into a hospital and says me and my wife kidnapped her and forced her to do heroin. Now, we did not force her to do heroin. She was just saying this to get shit. But, like, when I go in to follow her, I'm like, Mom, what's going on? And the cop pulls me aside. He's like, your mom's telling me that you forced her to do heroin. And I'm, I'm literally looking at him. My heart sinks to my stomach because I'm thinking I'm about to get arrested for this. So I like, I literally run out of the hospital and I go to the, the car. I grab my dog out of the car, leave the cat and we just start walking. And we have a, like a family friend who has been trying to get me clean for five years. Come pick us up. We get to their house and they're letting us stay the night. They have like, I don't know, two or three kids. One kid's like 11 years old. We're sleeping in his room. And uh, he has a wallet in the closet and had $60 in it. So I just steal the $60 from this 11-year-old kid and I go spend it on drugs and I get back. And they're bo both the people who I've been trying to get me clean were sitting there and they're like, man, like, I, we know you stole that money. You got to go. And uh, so that was just, then we, it was just me and my significant other at the time. Your mom was staying at the the, the, the rehab. rehab. Yeah, my mom went into rehab. We didn't know which rehab she went to. Um, so what's like the moment where you guys are both you and your wife are like, we need to fix this. We need to turn this around. We need to get help. So that didn't come. We actually uh, were living in the car, and she reported the car stolen while she was in rehab. Your mom did. Yeah. So uh, there is a city police uh can police they ran my plates one day and saw that it was a stolen vehicle quote unquote and they arrested me and my wife they took the dogs and the cat like they dragged dude like i i still have trauma about it like they dragged my dog out of the car and took him to the main site as i was locked in handcuffs in the back seat this dog was crying like and whining he, he knew what was happening and that was messed up. So they take us to jail. Um, and we're sitting there for 24 hours or something. And they uh, pull us out and they say the charges had been dropped. Because they found out that the car obviously was not stolen. Uh, and that, uh, that left us without a car. So we thought we would go to rehab too. Just that moment you said we're going to go to rehab? So we, her and I couldn't talk. Because she had warrants from Florida where they said that they were going to come get her, but they never did. They just said that so they would hold her an additional 72 hours. But a guard let me scream to her that I'm going to rehab. I'll go to QEH, which is a rehab in Detroit. If you get out, go there. So I go to QEH. Um, I'm withdrawn. I'm, I'm still sick because I only spent 24 hours in the um, – in the jail. So I was still withdrawing, in the process of withdrawing. Uh, so they start giving me meds and stuff. I'm, I'm participating. Now, QBH, the rehab that I was in, wasn't necessarily the best rehab. You know what I mean? It, it's just kind of uh, a boarding house for, for homeless people who are also addicted. Um, but I meet someone there who has property for rent. 
And instead of completing the probation, or not the probation, the, uh, the rehab, I said, listen, like, I'm going to leave. Let me rent a room from you, and me and my wife will, will work for you um, to pay the rent. So I do that. And now this place that we moved to is in the absolute worst part of Detroit. Like, it, it's the east side, the street's called Six Mile. You've seen the movie Eight Mile, right? Yeah. South of Eight Mile is the ghetto. Um, and Six Mile, McNichols is the real name of it, is by far the most dangerous part, the most violent, the most addicted. Um, imagine Baghdad. That's what the east side McNichols looks like. Um, burned down houses everywhere. And this is... We're living in like an old church building. And uh, the guy who actually ran the place, the landlord, he was not really a nice guy, dude. Like, he tried to trick with my wife. So she, he was trying to get her to do prostitution. Um, and she wouldn't. So eventually, like, he demanded that we leave, despite us having our entire house here. So he calls the cops. Um... And I run because I think that I'm going to get arrested because I still have warrants. You know what I mean? So I get out of there and my significant other stays. And it turns out the cops left and the landlord like choked her, pushed her down the stairs. And like that's when she got out. So now we're both out on the street, nowhere to live, but we're still using. You're back to using again. Back to using. But we're literally... Like, I can't describe the, the squalor that we weren't living in. Like, legitimately burned down houses. Houses that have no roof, but they had a crawl space that was, like, the wide is this table that we could crawl into and sleep. But we would never sleep. And this is when the time my, uh, my wife began real prostitution. Like, she was walking the street, getting picked up by strangers, and be gone for days. And I would just wait there. And dude, I can't. There's no words to describe you what that was like. I, like sitting in a dope house. Every single person in that house has either slept with my wife, beat my ass, or stolen from me. Every single day, bro. Like for months. We spent like seven months out there living in burned down houses. My wife got raped twice out there. But that's the consequences of addiction, man. Like, that's what we were living in. That's what was normal to us. How do you turn this around? Because obviously this isn't going on right now. So you had a pretty quick turnaround time because this isn't too long ago. Yeah, so actually this is... Um, we had about uh, six months out there. And I, um, we were in a crack house one time. And I'm sitting there. And... Uh, Something hit me, man. A moment of clarity. I like to say, even to this day, that like whatever energy manipulates all of existence was speaking to me. It told me, your mom deserves to know you're alive. This girl who is, like, she's three years younger than me, who was like 22 at the time, she deserves to have a normal life. You can do this. And I'm like sobbing in this chair holding her saying we got to get out we have to do something so the next morning we called rehab um and we go and the first place we went to um was team wellness and that is like a co-ed place so her and i could see each other but that was only three days and then we split went to different places um and my wife went back out there I continued to stay clean, though. Um, I was in treatment consistently for, like, eight months. Like, I had no phone. Like, I, I was really scared of myself because I know that disease lives inside of me today. Like, right now, that disease lives here. It's arrested because I do things every day to make sure that I'm living a life in recovery. How do you fight those urges? <laughs> um, dude, I'll be straight up, man. Like, it... 
that moment of clarity removed those urges from me, bro. Do you think if you didn't have that moment of clarity, you would have ended up dead? Yes, without question. There is no doubt in my mind today, if that moment of clarity did not come, I would die. Dude, when I was out there, like, I was getting fucking jumped on the regular. Like, the regular. I, like, and I couldn't shower for six months. So, like, when I did shower, when I got into rehab, there was black, red blood coming out of my hair. There, like, dude, I was disgusting, bro. Do you value your life a lot more now? Holy shit, dude. I love my life today. Because, you know, there's people that do less drugs that pass away from drug use. Mm -hmm. And you've gone through, like, this whole thing, and you've survived that, and you overcame that. It's, just, it's crazy. It really is to think about, like, when you put everything yeah. into perspective. Yeah, I, dude, I... You said at the beginning of this that it was kind of destined to be. And I'll say that addiction is the greatest thing to ever happen to me. It allowed me to grow and value my life in a way that I never thought would be possible. It allowed, showed me what not to do with my daughter. You know what I mean? Um, I'm assuming your wife ended up getting clean now that yeah, you have a kid. So, uh, actually like three or four months into me being clean at the rehab i'm sending her regular messages saying like please come back like you are in oblivion right now like you are suffering in an abyss so deep that there's no way out unless you get help please let me help you and uh one day she comes visit me at the rehab and she's blowed out like high out of her mind on heroin and I tell her, like, I can never see you again. Like, I can't do this. This hurts too much. And uh, eventually she, she went into rehab. She, she called me one day, and she's like, I'm going in. So, like, I, she served, like, 14 days at rehab, detoxed. I got her into a sober living house. Um, yeah, and then she started working this stuff. She started going to 12-step meetings. What about your parents? What's your relationship with them like today? Yeah, so um, when I moved away from my father, uh, he overdosed and died. Oh, wow. I'm sorry to hear that, man. And uh, like two months later, same thing happened to my brother. He overdosed and died too. Um, and that's... It's just the consequences of addiction, man. Do you use that as like a motivator or something to keep you going? Yeah, 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 definitely I do. Um, I have a lot of motivation today to, to continue this life. What I will say is um, I got a whole bunch of people in my circle addicted to heroin. And about every single person that I got addicted is dead now. Um, my friend Corey Peters and um, my friend Zach Whitehead, both of them best friends. Like I, I'm... Zach was autistic, um, and he was a real cool cat, dude. He, he, even though he had autism, he was funny as hell. He would just, like, say, pineapple, like, out of nowhere. Like, you'll be playing video games, and they'll say that. And, it, and Dude, I don't know, man. He was just a really warm figure. Um, but I got him addicted to heroin, man. And uh, one day, like, someone that he was using with, like, he overdosed in the car. And they just pushed him out of the car and let him die. Wow. I mean, something we don't think about is how our actions affect others. Bro, I, I think about that a lot today because it, it really hurts, man. Like, knowing that, like, the actions that I did took someone's son away. What happened to your mother? Um, my mom stayed clean after she got uh, into that rehab when we were living in the street. She stayed clean. Started work because she, like I said, she went back to school, became a social worker. She's the inspiration from, like, me when I got clean to go back to school uh, for social work. And, uh, yeah, man, she, um, she's a powerful woman now. You know what I mean? She's, she's helped a whole lot of people. She, she works for a drug and alcohol treatment center in Michigan, too. Um, yeah, what do, you, what do you do for work now? Well, what's your life like now? So, uh, my life now consists of recovery in all aspects. Um, I work at a drug and alcohol treatment center, um, helping people with, uh, like just reg reducing the barriers to recovery. You know, either it's like homelessness, they can't find a place. They, 
They um, need primary care doctors. They need medically assisted treatment like Suboxone or Methadone. Um, and then I just recently started my own business um, where I connect people with uh, a peer counselor or a peer recovery coach to follow them throughout the inpatient and um, treatment settings. Because the continuity of care needs to be there. You need to have someone who's been on your side from the beginning of your journey to the end. I mean, not that there is an end, but like they need, need to follow you through. And that's what we're going to do. And um, we consult with other treatment organizations like in uh, all 50 states. Like we'll fly out anywhere um, and do an audit f for a, a treatment center to make sure that they're like, they can be CARF certified, the Center for Addiction Recovery Facilities, um, or integrating new programs. It, it We just prepare other treatment centers to be the best possible treatment center they can be. That's awesome, man. And how long have you been clean for now? Uh, I'm going on five years. So now, is this like the first time you've actually sat down to talk about your story? Yeah, dude, literally. Like literally the first time. What was like the motivation to like fly out, meet a stranger, talk about your story? Dude, I- Cause uh, like, what would you say to like people that are, that want to share their story or are hesitant to talk about it? What's like your experience? Man, it, it's important to share that experience, strength, and hope. That's the the entire to carry the message to the person still suffering that there is another side to this. You know what I mean? Addiction is is a monster, bro. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. And it happens like it could be your mother, your brother, a sister, a friend, a, another family member. This is a very real, you know, issue yeah. in the world, and it doesn't just affect you; it affects the people around you. Dude, literally, like everyone in America, they have a, a mom, a dad, a son, a daughter who has some sort of addiction. You know what I mean? Whether it's to um, marijuana, prescription pills, like just because it's prescribed by a doctor doesn't mean that it's not going to affect you and your ability to not become addicted. You know what I mean? Like this, these are still drugs. Now, if you could go back to your teenage self and have a conversation with that person, person what would you say to him man i don't know to be honest i would just tell him to enjoy the suffering you know what i mean like that is dude like that i fucking that was dude it was really hard to overcome being raped uh, uh addicted parents like yeah it was hard to overcome but dude holy shit this trauma motivated me like, I don't have to suffer alone in here. There's people out there whose story is just like mine who needs to be told. Someone who has something to be said that you can recover from this. That's why it's important to share my story. Because my story is not unique in that. I am a garden variety drug addict. You know what I mean? I am not special in any way. Like, what's special is the community and joy and fulfillment you get after those hard moments of wanting to change those those moments of clarity we got to focus on those and use those because otherwise we're gonna die out there you know what i mean and i i know that i don't want any more sons daughters moms or dads to be gone and i owe it to Corey and zach the people that i got addicted to heroin i owe it to them to bust my ass today. I believe, do you know what, so you're familiar with a phoenix? Yeah. I believe I am a phoenix. I have died and risen from the ashes. I have been reborn. I'm not like a Christian. I mean, like, dude, I, I don't know what religion's what, you know what I mean? But I do know that there is a force out there greater than me. And whatever it was pushed me. You know what I mean? It gave me that moment of clarity to just see for just a split second that there was something greater out there. And I was scared at first because I was comfortable in that insanity, dude. Like that's my whole, I, that was my whole life. I, drugs and alcohol and, and violence and trauma. That was it. I was everything. But I was comfortable with it. I was scared to live outside of my comfort zone. I was scared that I would fail I was scared that I didn't have it in me to to do the things necessary to stay clean today. But I do. And now I mean? you have the story to share. And like we were talking about earlier, like 
it's those stories that no one really knows about that are the most relatable to individuals because you're just like you're the, you're the typical average person that w- did not choose this lifestyle. You did not want this lifestyle. It was kind of thrown at you. Yeah. And certain decisions of others and yourself brought you down this journey and you were able to survive that. And now you have the story of hope and inspiration to, you know, inspire others. So Dylan, thank you for coming on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and I wish you the best. I wish your wife the best, your family, uh, your daughter, and uh, excited to see what you do um, with your story and, and continuing to like spread that positivity. Thank you. And I appreciate being on, man. You, you got a cool thing going here and uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that you're, you're helping people share their story. Thanks, man.